Hey, what's up, y'all? Kofi here, and today we're going to be talking about... Uh... Hey, man, you got this. This is your first time being on video in a while. Just take a couple of deep breaths. You got this, man. Thanks, man. Hey, wait, is this like one of those conversations where there's like one of us, but there's two of us, but there's one of us? Me? No. You're hallucinating, dude. NBA Live 2005 and March Madness 2005 released just months apart from each other, and both represent pivotal parts in each series. With the Xbox 360 on the horizon at the time, this was the last time that both games would be solely focused on the previous generation of consoles. The following year, NBA Live 06 made the Xbox 360, while NCAA March Madness 06 did not. The 2005 installments were the last time before we figured out that <laughs> Neither series had any idea how to adjust to the Xbox 360. Anyway, in this video, we're going to look at a few features the games had in common and a few places where the games separated themselves from each other. So first up is gameplay. For the most part, the core gameplay is damn near identical, and like most basketball games in that time, did not age well at all. And I know I may be a bit unreasonable, but that just goes to preach the progress that basketball games have made. When you stick a recent game next to one of these 2005 staples, the improvement is exponential. Nowadays, going back to both games, the 5 on 5 gameplay is hard to play now. There are no signature jump shot animations, defense is choppy as hell, passing you have very little control over. I could go on and on, but I realize that I'm being unfair. However, we can take a look at what both games introduced. So NBA Live and March Madness both had freestyle control and wanted to give the players more options with the limited amount of buttons at the player's disposal. The game's addition was freestyle air. You would be able to perform putback dunks, adjust your layups and dunks in midair as well as do some cool new stuff. This was in both NBA Live and NCAA March Madness. However, NCAA March Madness had one additional feature that separated itself from NBA Live and made it a much better experience in my opinion. I'm talking about the floor general system. This allowed you to run certain offensive sets and plays. This is a delightful way to not only get some great scoring opportunities, but it also promotes AI off-ball movement, which is the main thing basketball games struggle to tackle. It sucked playing a basketball game back in the day, controlling one person and you look around the rest of the court and realize your teammates aren't doing anything. Like at all. In March Madness, you were able to pick from six different offensive sets, and I know it doesn't sound like a lot today, but these were versatile sets that allowed you to have more than one option within each play. For example, if you ran the 1-4, you could either move the play initiator to the left or the right, or pass to the four other people on the team, and the set would run differently depending on the action that you performed. In addition, you could also set up presses and zone defenses. By the way, when I say that there are only six offensive sets, I only mean that there are only six offensive sets in your disposal while the game is being played. There is a deeper library of plays that you could run out of timeouts, and if you wanted to change any of the six set plays before a game, you could do that with the library of offensive sets in the game. Think of them as audibles in any football game you've played. There are more than six plays in your playbook, but you can only call six audibles, if that makes sense. It was a very cool and advanced idea that does not show up in NBA Live. Which sucks for a number of reasons. It was good to be able to run plays for JJ Redick and Adam Morrison in March Madness, while in the NBA Live game it was a bit more complicated to get your shooters open. This was really disappointing to see and really held back the potential of the NBA Live gameplay for that year. Now, the reason why they maybe didn't do it is because the shot clock is 24 seconds, and in college at the time it was 35. However, my counterpoint is that with only six sets at your disposal, it doesn't seem that overwhelming. It seems that you could do the quick D-pad action and still get your play off. Before I continue, let me explain how plays and set offenses relate to each other. You can run many different plays out of a specific set offense. For example, in middle school, we had a play called Horns Down, which ran out of the Horns offensive set. Does that make sense? Another way you could put it is if you put all your documents in a specific folder on your computer. 
That specific folder is the offensive set, and the documents inside that folder are the plays. Is everybody good now? Okay. If you compare it to 2K's current play calling system, it's so intricate and deep that it actually takes away from the gameplay. For example, if you want to call a specific play and not a freelance set for a player, you have to basically waste at least 7 seconds of your time just searching for the play, then if your player is out of position, which they probably are, there's a few more seconds to wait for them to get into position. You see what I'm getting at? There's not enough time in NBA 2K to really call the specific play that you want. However, 2K's freelance set system is different. If you call a freelance set one possession, the players will keep running to that specific spot for future possessions. That way you can start to build recognition and you already know where they're going to be. And honestly, that's the closest basketball games are going to get in terms of advanced play calling. The 24 second play clock is the main factor in all of this. Now if this was NCAA March Madness 1950, you wouldn't have to worry about shot clocks, or crossovers, or three pointers, or dribbling with your non-dominant <laughs> I'm sorry, Bob Cousy. Anyway, in NBA Live, the thing that halfway makes up for this is off-ball control, which was introduced in NBA Live 2004. It's still a good way to get open, facilitate alley-oops, and handoffs, so you do have some options to facilitate offense. But there were way more options in March Madness. Moving on to game modes. Now both games had dope ass game modes and both had new ones that were promoted on the back of the box. The big addition to NBA Live 2005 was All-Star Weekend. You had the dunk contest, three point shootout, rookie sophomore game, and All-Star game. Now I'm not going to talk about the All-Star game or rookie sophomore game because they aren't really that special. The only difference from you being able to put those teams in play now and in this mode is the fact that you're able to throw the ball off the backboard. And that's it. The three point contest was okay. Anyone could enter and it was fun to see who could make the most. I like to pick all the centers with zero ratings and see how many each person could make. And that honestly should just be the real three point contest one of these years, to be honest. Dear NBA, please do that once. Now the real show is a dunk contest. This is still one of the best, if not the best dunk contest we've ever seen in a video game. I'm in the camp that thinks it's the best, and that's not just the nostalgia talking. This game had options. And this was the first video game that taught us that all 50s are not created equal. The most important part about this dunk contest is the fact that a lot of these take great skill and timing. To this day, there are still a lot of lob dunks that I just can't do. Well yeah, because you sucked. Oh shut up. But seriously, you actually had to practice for the dunk contest. NBA Live realized this and even gave us three specific dunk tutorials and practices just for it. You had to master the lobs, the gathers, the flips, the timing, the shot clock tosses, the out of bounds video tosses, all of it. This game mode was actually harder than the 5 on 5 gameplay. Now yes, there were some easier dunks that could still get away with 50s, but if you wanted to truly call yourself a dunk contest master, you actually had to put in effort. And for most of you, that's probably going to be the best part of the video. So, I mean, if you guys leave now, like, I get it. I mean, some jerk is probably just going to put the time code in the comment section. You know what, actually? I'll just do it myself. Anyway, so the NCAA game didn't have All-Star Weekend, but they did have something I think is really cool personally. It's the College Classics feature. In this mode, you would insert yourself back into these classic moments over the decades. You get to replay moments like The Shot, David vs. Goliath, Beat the Unbeatable, and more. I've also written an article about it on SB Nation if you want to check out an in-depth review of each level in terms of difficulty and the history behind it. So click on that afterwards, I guess. It felt like an interactive time capsule that you could just go back and revisit anytime you wanted to. I only wish that there were way more levels and that the gameplay wasn't as exploitable so that all the levels could feel like a challenge, because they're not all the same. I had to use some tactics that I'm not really proud of just to beat Virginia with Shamanad, okay? Now, moving on to NCAA's Dynasty mode, which is fun and flawed at the same time. You could pick a team and turn them into an absolute force to be reckoned with. The only problem is that the turnaround is way too quick. Now before I continue, there's something I want to say about both games that apply to both games. The rating system is trash. 
These games depended on a pretty stagnant rating system that put players on an exponential scale, rather than a more linear scale like the games we have today. Both games had something called strengths that are divided into four icons, dunk, block, lockdown, steal, person, and three-pointer. In this game, if you had two players with the same overall, the player with more icons would be the more useful player, even though the overalls are the same, if that makes sense. Here's an example. So the Heat and Pacers are both 80 overall as a team, right? So here's a look at their rosters. Seems like each team has a chance and they're fairly even, right? Now let's look at another 80 overall team, the Utah Jazz. Yeah. What the hell? I hope that sums up my point. Anyway, back to the March Madness Dynasty problem. Recruiting just wasn't a challenge and it seemed like no matter what team you chose, you could end up with the number one class if you bother the top recruits enough. And all of these top recruits are better or close to just as good as the best player currently on your team. And most of them have more than one icon. Take a look at the roster for the knockoff McDonald's All-American game people that they probably didn't have licenses for. It's just too easy to recruit in this game and then have a dynamite squad in the next season. This led to a dynasty mode that didn't seem like you were building a team, but rather only replacing one. However, this was the only way to get some of the best players in the game all on one team without having to use creative player, so I'll let it slide. Now NBA Live's dynasty mode had the opposite problem. Yes, the game let you both scout players and try to woo free agents, however, the scouting remains to be the most tedious part of this game. Especially when you do all the workouts and then get to the actual draft and realize that all of the rookies are absolute trash. In this simulation, my first round pick was a 49 overall. First round pick! When you see shit like this, it makes you feel like the whole scouting part was pointless to begin with. I'm not going out of my way to scout and end up with a 49 overall point guard that can't cross over. So we have a game where the newcomers are too overpowered, and another game where the newcomers are basically unplayable at the start. Both are broken, so you have to go with the NCAA system because at least you have fun building a dynasty even though your team is going to be a smidge OP. And for both games, the simplicity of the gameplay didn't reward the complexity of the improvement and development systems implemented in both games. There was no point in working on improving your point guard's layup or dunk rating if you were going to get blocked by Sean Bradley every single time. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Sean Bradley is like a 56 or something overall in 2005, but since he has a high block rating, he's more useful than a 75 overall with no icons. And that's the main hurdle that gets in the way of both games. The gameplay at its core was fun, but not ready for the more advanced and detailed ideas that each series had for each other. And sadly, no gameplay in the series before the NBA Elite 11 fiasco really got close enough to making the outside ideas worth buying the game when you compared it to 2K. My favorite type of development drills were the type where you could just play a fun game, and how you participated was directly related to how much you improved. In the later 2K games and the My Career levels, they do a very good job with this, before they added VC. Well, that's all I have for this edition of- wait, oh god, this is not a series. Oh well. Feel free to like and subscribe so you never miss a video from me, and tap that bell icon, I think it's a bell icon, yeah? Okay. So I won't go broke if the worst happens to me. Thank you guys, I'll see you guys next time. Bye! I'm really just a fucking girl.